A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 7. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Life is suffering. That's clear. There is no more basic irrefutable truth. The fact of life's tragedy and the suffering that is part of it has been used to justify the pursuit of immediate selfish gratification for a very long time. This is the justification for chasing expediency. Because it's easy to, and I'll explain how. Short and sorrowful is our life, and there is no remedy when a man comes to his end and no one has been known to return from Hades. Because we were born by mere chance, and hereafter we shall be as though we had never been. Because the breath in our nostrils is smoke, and the reason is a spark kindled by the beating of our hearts. When it is extinguished, the body will turn to ashes, and the spirit will dissolve into empty air. Our name will be forgotten in time, and no one will remember our works. Our life will pass away like the traces of a cloud, and be scattered like mist that is chased by the rays of the sun and overcome by its heat. For all our allotted time is passing of a shadow, and there is no return from our death, because it is sealed up, and no one turns back. Come. Therefore, let us enjoy the good things that exist and make use of the creation to the full as in youth. Let us take our fill of costly wine and perfumes and let no flower of spring pass us by. Let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they wither. Let none of us fail to share in our reverie. Everywhere let us leave signs of enjoyment, because this is our portion, and this is our lot. Let us oppress the righteous poor man, let us not spare the widow, nor regard the grey hairs of the aged. But let our might be our law of right, for what is weak proves itself to be useless. <sighs> there is an air of optimism at the end of that that quote but there's also a very confronting and very real reality of existence while we there is no we have not yet proved that there is such thing as an afterlife that there is anything beyond death that in fact at the end of the day the universe doesn't care about us and essentially we will be forgotten in time. As enough time passes, we will all be forgotten. That's, that's what the reality, the stark reality of life appears to be. It may not be entirely true for some though, because for guys like Socrates, for the greatest philosophers and leaders of our time, we are remembering them hundreds if not thousands of years into the future. But even thousands of years is a mere speck of time in the whole span of universal time and existence. It's not a justification for nihilism, but it seems like a very real reality that we need to confront and to interact with. The delay of gratification. Something that every human eventually learns is that something better might be attained in the future by giving up something of value in the present. That is what it partly means to chase meaning over expediency. For example, I'm giving up time, energy, effort, my resources to analyze, interpret, and summarize these books on this channel. I'm making a short-term but meaningful sacrifice in the present, I'm giving up something, so that in the future, one, I am more prepared and better equipped for the chaos of life and the unpredictable nature of life. So I'm better equipped to handle myself. And number two, so others can also be better equipped and that I can selfishly grow 
my own base of influence. So that, by and I've been doing this for years, that was, that is always something in people's head when you're creating a brand or business. There is always the idea, I believe, that of growth, that you're giving up time and energy and money in the present for potential future prosperity. Two archetypal foundational questions arose because the discovery of sacrifice of work. Both have to do with the ultimate extension of the logic of work, which is sacrifice now to gain later. The first question, what must be sacrificed? Small sacrifices may be sufficient to solve small singular problems, but it is possible that larger, more comprehensive sacrifices might solve an array of large and complex problems all at the same time. This is obvious for some, common sense for others. Adapting to the necessary discipline of medical school will, for example, fatally interfere with the licentious lifestyle of a hardcore undergraduate party animal. Giving that up is a sacrifice. So sacrifices are necessary to improve the future and larger sacrifices can be better. Because some people believe that you don't need to sacrifice anything. That, that, that Some people don't prescribe to the idea that, that sacrifices are even necessary uh, to create what you want. So maybe there's a rebuttal for it. Second question. We must ask to begin with what would be the largest, most effective, most pleasing of all possible sacrifices and then how good might the best possible future be if the most effective sacrifice could be made. So we all as individuals must determine what do we want? What are we willing to temporarily sacrifice or sacrifice indefinitely to achieve what we want to achieve. However, this fundamental idea of sacrifice to produce potential future reward is in some ways contradictory of our evolution and our ancient fundamental animal instincts. And in some ways, I'll, I'll explain. The realization that pleasure could be usefully forestalled dawned on us with great difficulty. It runs absolutely contrary to our ancient fundamental animal instincts, which demand immediate satisfaction, particularly under conditions of deprivation, which are both inevitable and commonplace. So what, what Peterson, I believe, is referencing there is hundreds to thousands of years ago, um, as the human species evolved and the hunter-gatherer tribes uh, proliferated throughout the world, uh, their interaction with the this sacrifice paradigm was was different because immediate satisfaction of survival and quenching basic survival needs of, of hydration and food and shelter were the number one priority. Without getting into too much detail, moreover, such delay only becomes useful when a civilization has stabilized itself enough to guarantee the existence of delayed reward in the future. If everything you save will be destroyed or worse stolen, there is no point in saving. It is for this reason that a wolf will down 20 pounds of raw meat in a single meal. He isn't thinking, man, I hate it when I binge. I should save some some of this for next week. And that can be the same said for our hunter-gatherer uh, previous ancestors who interacted with this differently. Where, yes, if they could, you'd imagine they would want to save stores of food, but then again, food can be heavy, especially when it's raw meat from animals. So carrying that can, is not very energy efficient. So oftentimes, like a wolf, various tribes would down uh, high amounts of calories uh, because they, they didn't know when the next meal would be in some scenarios, okay? Not, not all scenarios. So just to get the history, we have to understand the history of how the human species has interacted with this because now we all, most of us live in a stable society and, and we have the luxury of being able to, to save for the future, okay? World War Three happens tomorrow, that becomes even more a priority, but also our immediate survival becomes the priority. So saving is no longer the priority priority. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know. DM me, comment below. Because I keep forgetting, I'd like to let everybody know that all my videos, all these rules will are now available on podcast form 
on all podcast flat platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher. All platforms are available to listen to this on audio form if you prefer. The link is in the description. Well, now we're going to talk about the concept of sharing and how it's interwoven into this rule and principle and that to share does not mean to give away something you value and not get nothing back. That is instead only what every child who refuses to share fears it means. To share means properly to initiate the process of a trade. A child who can't share, who can't trade, can't have any friends because having friends is a form of trade. So it's the idea of like, your, to not share, to me seems like you would be pursuing expediency if you don't uh, execute and commit in the social um, interaction of sharing and trading. Benjamin Franklin once suggested that a newcomer to a neighborhood ask a new neighbor to do him or her a favor, citing an old maxim. He that has once done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged. So instead of forcing people to oblige to do something and guilting them into doing something, if you come out first and do this individual a favor, then the other person is more likely to do it back onto you. Not having the expectation, but just creating a uh, a social, hmm, just a, by, a natural byproduct of the social interaction of a trade and giving something. Now, it's actually talked about in, in, in How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, who I've also summarized. So it's very interesting. All these three books, 12 Rules for Life, 48 Laws of Power, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that all the, all the books on this channel that I've analyzed, they all are intertwining and inter, inter, interwoven. And it's very interesting to see. And I'd highly recommend going back and watching things because that there's, there's endless wisdom in it all. In Franklin's opinion, asking for some, asking someone for something was the most useful and immediate invitation to a social interaction. Such asking on the part of the newcomer provided the neighbor with an opportunity to show him or herself as a good person. This is the point. You give something to someone, you show yourself as a good person, but moreover, then now the other person has the opportunity to do the same onto you. It is better yet to share generously the something you have it's even better than that, however, to become widely known for generous sharing. That's something that lasts. And that can be in any form. It can be in this form. It can be in gift giving, which we know people love. Now, what's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. Things get better as the successful practice their sacrifices. The questions become increasingly precise and simultaneously broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice for the greatest possible good and the answers become deeper and profound increasingly let's use an extreme example like Elon Musk isn't he essentially asking how can he sacrifice his life because he is he I imagine no way to prove this but I imagine what we know about the effects of stress on the body and and limiting physical activity and, and altering um, nutrition and a whole host of other related things that we know Elon Musk is having to sacrifice uh, his own personal health in a lot of ways for the greatest possible good of mankind. Because we know, we understand at least, or we can empathize that with this one man, he to create what he's created so far and, and to further create what he's planning to create and his endeavors to, to colonize Mars and 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 his ambitions to, for for um, solar energy and, and so on and so forth, all of these lofty endeavors require a huge amount of sacrifice. But his the sacrifice, this is the greatest possible good that he has found, and arguably that that almost anybody in this planet um, is is chasing. So that's an example of maybe an extreme example, but an, an example of how anyone can implement this. And people complain like, my life isn't the way I want it to be. Like, they, they make excuses, uh, they cry, they complain, they whine. And it's like, if the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore it is time to examine your values. 
It is time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. It might even be time to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree. And greater sacrifices can do more effectively than lesser. Of that there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their soul. Thus the person who wishes to alleviate suffering, who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest sacrifices of self and child, of everything that is loved to live a life aimed at the good. He will forego expediency. He will pursue the path of the ultimate meaning and he will in that manner bring salvation to every desperate world. This is the power of sacrifice. This is the power of foregoing expediency. When, when Socrates was condemned to death and put to death, you know, he began to consider that it might be a blessing instead of a curse. He really restructured the way he approached his own death. And his decision finally to accept his fate allowed him to put away uh, a mortal terror in the face of death of itself prior to and during the trial of his death after the sentence was handed down. And even later, during his execution, he saw that his life had been so rich and full that he could let go gracefully. Socrates rejected expediency and the necessity for manipulation that accompanied it. He chose instead under the duress of, the, of his conditions to maintain his pursuit of the meaningful and the true. And 2500 years we remember his decision. And we can take comfort in it, and we can learn from it. If you cease to utter falsehoods and live, uh, live accordingly to the dictates of your conscience, you can maintain your nobility, even when facing the ultimate threat, if you abide truthfully and courageously by the highest of ideals. You will be provided with more security and strength than you will be offered by any short-sighted concentration on your own safety. If you live properly, fully, you can discover meaning so profound that it protects you even from the fear of death. Could all that be possibly true? Could we get to a place where we have made peace with ourselves so we can make peace with death? Amor fati. A love of fate. Death, toil, and evil. If someone fails and is rejected because he refused to make any sacrifices at all, well, that's at least understandable. He may still feel resentful and vengeful, but knows in his heart's heart that he is personally to blame. That knowledge generally places a limit on his outrage. However, it's much worse if he had actually foregone the pleasures of the moment, if he had strived and toiled on the things that still didn't work out, if he was rejected despite all his efforts and all his work, then he's lost the present and the future. Then his work, his sacrifice has been pointless. Under such conditions, the world darkens and the soul rebels. And I can tell you I've interacted with this and it's not a good feeling. It's one of the worst feelings, honestly. Uh, my story that I, I would, I'm going to share is, I used to play basketball. I used to dedicate my life towards basketball as, as some of the people here know who have listened to me for the last few years. You know, from 14, 15 years old until 2021, I, I, I wanted to pursue the highest possible aim within basketball, and that is to play professionally. So every day I would sacrifice, every day, in some way or another, I would sacrifice what the pleasures of the moment uh, to pursue the tremendous task of that I was pursuing. By the end of my journey, I wasn't successful in my goal of trying to play professionally, although I, I did go to America and I did play in Arizona. Um, and that was tremendous experience and the whole thing taught me, it put me on the path I am now. And, and it made me into the person I am today. And I'm extremely thankful for it. However, by the time I got to the end of the journey, and I realized I wasn't willing to sacrifice anymore for the, the dimming light at the end of the tunnel. A part of me realized I failed. Like, you had one goal, 
and you failed. It didn't work. You strived and toiled for thousands and thousands of hours. Yet you failed. You sacrificed relationships, money, time, sweat, blood, tears, literally. It's not an exaggeration. Emotion. All of this. And you were rejected despite your efforts. And so a part of you is like, what was this all for? The dark part of you asks that, what was all this for? But then you realize, you realize that without this experience, I'd be a mere fraction of who I am today. I would be nothing. I needed this, this experience, this, <laughs> this is not a reject, this is not a rejection, this is not a failure. It may be in the literal sense, but it's not in the metaphorical sense. It's realizing who I am. It's structuring my character. It's becoming a useful, good person in the world who understands himself, or at least tries to, and can sleep at night because he knows he's done everything possible. Everything possible. To pursue what is meaningful. And because he didn't pursue what is expedient, and he sacrificed in the present, he can live with himself because he, he exhausted everything out of the tank. And so he has integrity. He formed the characteristics that created a limitless potential. And I think it means so much to me because it's all you want. When, it's, when, when you want something more than anything else in the world, you, you pour everything, your heart, your emotion, your soul, your mind, everything into this. So that's why it means so much to me. Um, everyone has their own version. And that's mine. It has been my experience, Peterson says, that human beings are strong enough to tolerate the implicit tragedies of being without faltering, without breaking or worse, breaking bad. Earthquakes, floods, poverty, cancer. We're tough enough to take all of that. I'm talking about a little, little story about basketball and, you know, there's much more malevolent, uh, chaotic, tragic things that are going on. But human evil adds a whole new dimension of misery to the world. Conscious human malevolence can break the spirit even tragedy could not shake. You get why people can pursue things that are expedient. You get it. Life is indeed nasty, brutish and short, but man's capacity for evil makes it worse. This means that the central problem of life that the dealings with its brute force is not merely what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering, but what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering and evil. The conscious and voluntary and vengeful source of the worst suffering. Carl Gustav Jung, psychoanalyst extraordinaire said, No tree can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. And I've talked about this concept many times and Peterson has as well. It's this idea that you must confront malevolence. You must confront evil. You must confront what it's like to put yourselves in the shoes of the worst humans of our existence. The worst acts, the worst atrocities. From, holo from, from, from uh, the Holocaust to, to torture, to emotional torture, to murderous rape and killings you must interact with it all and you you must think about what it would be like can only then can your roots reach down to hell and it's not a bad thing you need to reach down to hell so then you can reach to heaven such a statement should give everyone who encounters it a pause 
There was no possibility for movement upward in the great psycho psychotheorist deeply considered opinion without corresponding corresponding moving downwards. It is for this reason that enlightenment is so rare. Because who wants to go through that? Who is willing to do that? Do you really want to meet who's in charge at the very bottom of the most wicked thoughts? Because guess what? It's you. You're in charge. And I'm going to shift gears to talk about God and what he represents in this rule. God is in no wise a safety net for the blind. He's not someone to be commanded to perform magic tricks or forced into self-revelation, not by his own son. And this is something I've interacted with when I was younger. When I was younger, uh, I, I, I grew up in a household uh, that believed in, in God and Jesus Christ. And when I was a young teenager and even a child, here's what I would do. And very few people know this. I would sit on my bed, and when I'm going, to, when tragedies of my life would, would, arise, when when suffering would arise, I would sit on my bed, and I would put my hands together and close my eyes, and sometimes I would cry to myself because I'd be going through certain tragedies and suffering. It would, it was painful, and I would, I would pray. I would pray to to God, to fix my problems. I would pray to God to. F- you know, f- to fix my suffering and to, f- and to fix the people around me who were suffering to help them, you know, and to help myself to fix me, you know, make me more intelligent, make me better looking, um, fix my, my family who is going through X and Y problems, please, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not, I don't have a girlfriend, help, I want a girlfriend, you know, I want someone to love, you know, help, can you, Help me do that. Why isn't that happening? And I, I would feel like it'd be like you'd be wishing for God to give you this, these things. You'd like to to create these like magic tricks. Like he's gonna just flick his fingers and all this. Oh, your life's gonna be better. I was deluded. I was like, this is. This is not productive in any shape or form. Hope is productive, but I was, I was almost begging for my life to be better without doing anything about it. And it's then I had to realize as I grew older. Hold on, I must assume responsibility. This is on me. This ain't on some, some guy in the sky, regardless of of, of his of whether he's real or not. It's not about whether the existence of God is factually true or not. It's, it's about the idea of relying on some universal force or some, some, some entity that is out of your control to fix your problems. And the only one who's going to fix your problems, I realized, was me. I had to make myself into a better person to be desired by others. Oh, you want, oh, you, you want a relationship with somebody? Oh, you want to know what it feels like to love somebody and to have someone love you? Okay. Be someone worthy of loving. How about that? How about you fix yourself and make yourself into a person who's worthy of being loved and so, but more, most of all, be be worthy enough to love yourself. Because you don't even love yourself right now and you want to be loved? Get the fuck out of here. It's It's a contradiction of life. You know, you want to fix your family? Fix yourself. You want to fix your suffering? Look in the mirror, you know, and Peterson says something very important here. Christ does not causally order or even dare ask God to intervene on his behalf. Yet I was doing it. If Christ didn't do it, I was doing it to God. Ha, that Christ didn't even do it. But you're doing it to God. You're asking this, this pie in the sky entity to fix your problems. He refuses to dispense with his responsibility for the events of his own life. He refuses to demand that God prove his presence. He refuses as well to solve the problems of moral vulnerability in the merely personal manner. By compelling God to save him, because that would not solve the problem for everyone else and for all time. It doesn't solve the problem. Christianity and its problems. I cannot merely order myself to take action, and neither can you. I will stop procrastinating, I say, but I don't. I will eat properly, I say, but I don't. I will end my drunken misbehavior, but I don't. 
I cannot merely make myself over in the image constructed by my intellect, particularly if that intellect is possessed by an ideology. I have a nature and so do you and so do we all. We must discover that nature and contend with it before making peace with ourselves. What is it that we most truly are? What is it that we most truly become knowing who we most truly are? We must get to the very bottom of things before such questions can be truly answered. I would like to provide a rebuttal. You know, it's the idea of like, I will just stop doing something that's harmful to me. You know, and Peterson seems to purport that we must get to the bottom of these questions and, and almost figure out ourselves before we can fix ourselves. And while I don't agree with that, I will challenge the idea that you can't just stop being self-destructive. I will challenge that because when I hear people like David Goggins speak, it proves that the human potential is almost limitless. You have to keep attacking. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. You must break the soul of whatever the fuck is in front of you. That's what I realized. I was never breaking the soul of anything in front of me. So that's why I came up with a thing called Taking Souls in my book. I started to devise ways to break a soul of a human being, of, a, of an object, of, of, of whatever's in front of me. If you keep on attacking something, nothing wants to stand in front of anything that is relentless. You can just stop and you can just keep going. And I try and teach myself this every week. Every time I go through physical endurement of some, some sort. So, you know what? I don't fall on those laurels. You say you can't stop. I disagree. You can. Willpower and discipline are some of the most two powerful forces that a human has access to. Use them. Figure out how to use them. It's not my responsibility or his responsibility or her responsibility to show you how. Figure it out. Nike's motto, just do it, might just be the answer to everything. <laughs> what do you want? Go. Start. Do. Doubt. Past me and nihilism. Now we're going to continue on because on the topic of uh, evil, malevolence, that I really enjoy talking about and uh, that Peterson has brought up again. In Alexander Scholznitzen's Gulag Archipelago, uh, he discussed the Nuremberg trials, which he considered the most significant events of the 20th century. The conclusion of the, those trials were as follows. There are some actions that are so intrinsically terrible that they run counter to the proper nature of human being. This is true essentially cross-culturally across time and place. These are evil actions. No excuses are available for engaging in them. To dehumanize a fellow being, to reduce him or her to the status of a parasite, to torture and to slaughter with no consideration of individual innocence or guilt, to make an art form of pain, that is wrong. And that is the deepest roots of evil. And searching through the lowest reaches of human thought and action, Understanding my own and your own capacity to act like a Nazi prison guard or a gulag archipelago trustee or torturer of children in a dungeon. You must grasp what, is, what it means to take the sins of the world onto oneself. Each human being has immense capacity for evil. I will keep echoing this time and time again. Sit back and think. It's going to be very confronting, but just let's sit back and think and feel. It's not just think, it's feel. Because it could have been any one of us, a Nazi prison guard. I would never do something like that. What the hell are you talking about? Do you think they just woke up one day and just started torturing people? No, that's not what happened. Most of the time. <laughs> they... It was a slow, gradual formation of malevolence and evil. 
like like a like a seed that that grows into a plant but this plant doesn't produce oxygen it produces poison so what would it be like to turn that gas on watch all those people die what would it be like to torture a child what would it see it's tough because you know I'm, I'm trying to think about it here but then I'm trying to describe it and when you describe something then you feel it and you can see even now it's like I think movies have glorified violence and they've desensitized us, desensitized us to, to violence and torture and pain and suffering in some ways. But the act of evil is ever more stark and painful and present. And what does torture mean? It could be more, it could be described, you know, it could be characterized through acts like waterboarding, like sticking, like peeling nails off, off someone's hand with uh, with pliers imagine doing that to a child imagine waterboarding a child what about a baby what about a pregnant woman what about what about what about driving a knife through a pregnant woman's belly you don't think that happened you don't think that's happened you don't think that's happening somewhere right now? Seven billion people. You don't think that's happened today? <laughs> You'd be naive to think that. If we can learn what it's like to feel and visualize and think about the immense capacity for evil that we all have, I, I feel we can then understand it a lot better. And we can become better as people. That's why I do this. Lastly, meaning as the higher good. Peterson says, It is partly because of this interaction between evil and good, and malevolence and benevolence, that he was able to draw these fundamental moral conclusions in this book. Aim up, pay attention, fix what you can fix, don't be arrogant in your knowledge, strive for humility because totalian pride manifests itself in intolerance, oppression, torture, and death. Become aware of your own insufficiency, insufficiency your cowardice, malevolence, resentment, and hatred. Consider the murderousness of your own spirit before you dare accuse others, and before you attempt to repair the fabric of your world. Maybe it's not the world that's at fault, maybe it's you. You've failed to make the mark. You've missed the mark. You've fallen short of the glory of God. You've sinned. And all that is your contribution to the insufficiency and evil of the world. And above all, don't lie. Don't lie about anything. Ever. Lying heeds to hell. It is the great and the small lies of the Nazi and communist states that produced the deaths of millions of people. One lie at a time. That's how it went. Consider then that the alleviation of unnecessary pain and suffering is good. Make that an axiom, to the best of my ability, I will act in a manner that leads to the allevi alleviation of unnecessary, that is the word I am highlighting, unnecessary pain and suffering, because there is an element of necessary pain and suffering that we all must go through. And if you reject it, if you try and push to the side and live a life of comfort and, and perfect solitude and peace, then you are not equipped for the world and the world that, that the reality of the world that is out there. Because it can all go to real shit tomorrow. It really can. And hell, most of us aren't prepared. Majority are not prepared. Oh, way too soft and cushy. Out, out of the edges of our of our world are being nerfed day by day. Especially young children. If I had a kid today, oh my god. I continue. You have now placed at the pinnacle of your moral hierarchy a set of propositions and actions aimed at the betterment of being. Why? Because we know the alternative. The alternative was the 20th century, the Cold War. The alternative was close to hell, that the difference is not worth discussing. 
Expedience is the following of blind impulse. It's short-term gain. It's narrow and selfish. It lies to get its way. It takes nothing into account. It's immature and responsible. Meaning is its mature replacement. Meaning emerges when its impulses are regulated, organized, and unified. Meaning emerges from the interplay between the possibilities of the world and the value structure operating within that world. If the value structure is aimed at the betterment of being, the meaning revealed will be life-sustaining. It will provide the antidote for chaos and the suffering. It will make everything matter, will make everything better. So you can see now, finally, we're talking about the intricacies of meaning and expedience after we've laid the foundation. Meaning trumps expedience. Meaning gratifies all impulses now and forever. That's why we can detect it. If you decide that you are not justified in your resentment of being, despite its inequity and pain, you may come to notice things you should fix to reduce even by a bit of some unnecessary pain and suffering. You may come to ask yourself, what should I do today? In a manner that means, how could I use my time to make things better instead of worse? I believe that's what I'm doing now. Such tasks may announce themselves as a pile of undone paperwork that you could attend to to a room that you could make a bit more welcoming, or a meal that you could be a bit more delicious, healthy, and, and, and gratefully delivered to your family. It is not bliss, it is not happiness. It is something more like atonement for the criminal fact of your fractured and damaged being. It's payment of the debt you owe for the insane and horrible miracle of your existence. Expedience, that's hiding all the skeletons in the closet. That's covering the blood you just spilled with a carpet. That's avoiding responsibility. It's cowardly and shallow and wrong. It's wrong because mere expedience multiplied by many repetitions produces the character of a demon. It's wrong because expedience merely transfers the curse on your head to someone else or to your future self in a manner that will make your future and, fu and a future generally worse instead of better. To have meaning in your life is better than to have what you want because you may neither know what you want nor what you truly need. To have meaning in your life is better than to have what you want because you may neither know what you want nor what you truly need. Meaning is something that comes upon you of its own accord. You can set up the preconditions, you can follow meaning when it manifests itself but you cannot simply produce it as an act of will. You must earn it. Meaning signifies that you are in the right place at the right time, properly balanced between order and chaos, where everything lines up as best as it can in that moment. What is expedient works only for the moment. It's immediate, impulsive, and limited. What is meaningful, by contrast, is the organization, what would otherwise merely be expedient into a symphony of being. Meaning is what manifests itself when the many levels of being arrange themselves into a perfectly functioning harmony from atomic microcosm to cell to organ to individual to society to nature to cosmos so that, an act, so that action to each level beautif beautifully and perfectly facilitates action at all such that past, present and future are all at once redeemed and reconciled. Meaning is what emerges beautifully and profoundly like a newly formed rosebud opening itself out of the nothingness into the light of the sun. Meaning is the lotus striding upward through the dark lake depths through the ever clearing water, blooming forth on the very surface, revealing within itself the golden Buddha, himself perfectly integrated such that the revelation of the divine will make itself manifest in every word and gesture. Meaning is when everything there is comes together in an ecstatic dance of single purpose, the glorification of a reality so that no matter how good it has suddenly become, it can get better and better and better, more and more deeply forever into the future. Meaning happens when that dance has become so intense that all the horrors of the past, all the terrible struggle engaged by all, the, all of the life and all of humanity to that moment becomes necessary and worthwhile part of increasingly successful attempt to build something truly mighty and good. Meaning is the ultimate balance between, on one hand, the chaos of transformation and possibility, and on the other, the discipline of pristine order, whose purpose is to produce out of attendant chaos a new order that will be even more immaculate and capable of bringing forth a still more balanced and productive chaos and order. Meaning is the way the path of life more abundant, the place you live when you are guided by love and speaking truth and when nothing you want or could possibly want takes any precedence over precisely that. Do what is meaningful, not 
what is expedient. Also, for those who have made it this far, I've now put in the description uh, links to purchase 12 Rules for Life. If you'd like to purchase it, the links are in the description and in the comments. And also, if you'd like to see the books, my favorite books that have impacted me the most, there is also an Amazon link um, that goes to a categorized selection of books that have impacted me the most for those that are curious because there have been many that have asked. Thank you.